I thought it was very brave of George to leave. And it was a good thing that he did in the long run. Did you ever quit the dead milkman? <laughs> we're here with Joe Jack for the dead milkman. And we're talking about the new Get Back documentary. If you want dad jokes, click the link above for some Beatles jokes. Okay, Joe Jack, did you watch the new Get Back documentary? I did. I watched all three parts. And you're a Beatles fan. Unfortunately, I yes, I am. Unfortunately, if you watch a nine hour thing, I guess you have to be. What were your impressions coming away from the film, man? I felt like I was right there in rehearsal with them <laughs> at some points. But I, I enjoyed it for the most part. You really do get to kind of experience the creation of the songs along with the band. Yes. I got to see Michael Lindsay Hogg. That was interesting to see the filmmaker. I don't think he he's the guy who made the Let It Be film. Yeah, he was not in that film, though. It was now, interesting it on a be. lot of levels. I may have to watch it all again. Originally, it was uh, supposed to be a TV show. And then Michael Lindsay Hogg made it into a film, which is you can only walk, get it as a bootleg. It's really depressing because it really focuses on the breakup of the band. I actually didn't think it was depressing, at least not the first few times I saw it. I was excited by it. Yeah. But it does show that they were already broken up when, of course, when I saw it. So you, you get used to this sort of vision of the Beatles as really close friends. And even seeing them argue a little bit, like kind of was surprising. Yeah, you're talking about the letter B. Yeah, the letter B doesn't show them being very friendly. It's true. It, it sticks to the narrative of their... They're a band breaking up. All right, here's some moments I thought were interesting, and I'd love to have your reaction to them. We'll just crank through them, okay? Okay. Paul writing Get Back, like out of thin air, while he's waiting for John to show up. That was awesome. It was good to see how that, that came about. And it's also interesting to see John helping Paul with lyrics while he's writing it. The first lyrics for Get Back were... I mean, as much as they were a political parody, they still were too cringy, you know? Yeah. And But then vague is better sometimes, you know, lyrics-wise. Do you agree with that? Uh, I've learned that lesson. I hope, I, I hope I've learned that lesson, yes. Vague is better. Yeah, but he's sort of finding his way. He's just mumbling nonsense and kind of strumming the same riff and seeing what vocal works. It's fascinating to see because... It's a mess, and then four minutes later, it's like 50% written. But both George Harrison and Billy Preston bring it, bring the song to life. Yes, that actually leads me into the next thing is, you know, Billy Preston showing up and transforming the entire energy of the room and the record. So what did you think about that? I loved it. I loved to see Billy play. It's also a highlight of the original Let It Be film, too. No one had ever really played with the Beatles before. Yeah, studio musicians hired by George Martin. Maybe. Right, I mean, yeah, exactly. Some classical... They're not really playing with them. Yeah, Billy is jamming with them. And it's... Uh, it, even, I think it was it, J John or George asked him if he wanted to be a fifth Beatle. John asked him, and he was serious. And the other guys are like, no, no, J George said... No, I think it's hot enough with four of us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, that leads me to item number three. Quote, unquote, I think I'll be leaving the band now. Yeah, that's not in Let It Be either, the m movie, I don't think. I thought it was very brave of George to leave, and it was a good thing that he did in the long run. Did you ever quit the dead milkman? I don't, I, I, you don't I, I almost, I almost did. Of course, I mean, dude, in the course of a band, of a long band history, things happen. I'm not exactly. maligning the dead milkman. I'm just saying things, I'm asking, you know, you've had moments, it, it struck a chord is what I'm saying. I mean, we all quit at one point. Right, exactly. Yes. And, but only Spe temporarily. And speaking of chords, what about Paul saying that a chord is outdated, like a specific chord? I have to watch it again because I don't... What, what part was that in? It was in the first part and, man, they're playing Get Back and he says that a certain chord is like so two years ago. And George is like, what are you talking about? It's a chord. Chords don't get outdated. And Paul's arguing... G7 that, or something. You know, maybe a certain kind of a way of playing a chord progression might become 
True. Yeah. Sort of dated, but like a specific chord? Do you think that's possible? Maybe. I don't know. He was looking for a fresh chord. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that Paul McCartney suggested that for one of the, the TV show gimmicks that they have news, real news footage in between se segments. And at the yeah. very end, the news would be flash, news flash, the Beatles break up. It almost makes me think that he wanted the band to break up at that point. Here's another moment. George Harrison helping Ringo to write Octopus's Garden. That was pretty cool. That's a, that's a pretty cool segment. I like, I enjoyed that. I mean, and I also George starting to write Old Brown Shoe. And when he plays, isn't it, a, when they played, isn't it a pity, the George Harrison song. That ended segment one, right? Oh that my was gosh, very poignant. poignant. <laughs> oh man, the way we heard each other, it's just amazing. And of course, a George Harrison song, which was omitted from the Beatles catalog and which became one of his hits on... All Things Much Past, and was even covered by Nina Simone. Check out the Nina Simone record, Emergency Ward. It's like two long George Harrison jams. My Sweet Lord alone is worth the price of admission. Speaking of which, who is your favorite Beatle and why is it George Harrison? It's, why is it George Harrison? I just have, I, I think he was like the soul of the band. They couldn't be the Beatles without him. You know, you said on Big Questions with the Dead Milkman that you thought Paul McCartney was overrated. Am I yeah, right? But that, <laughs> I was counting his entire career. I was right, counting wings, everything was that he wings. did after the Beatles. I guess if I just stop at the Beatles, I can't say that really. Although right. I've been a fan for so long. Uh, yeah. The songs that I get tired of more often than not are Paul McCartney songs and the songs that don't that I always find more to like about are the John Lennon and George Harrison songs. Oh yeah, I can see that. But John Lennon and and Paul McCartney collaborated, so it may not be fair of me to divide them up that way, but I'm I'm talking about yeah, I guess who's the main songwriter. Yoko screaming, groundbreaking and ahead of its time, horrible noise or both. <laughs> I don't know if it's groundbreaking. <laughs> I mean, isn't it kind of like it's Sonic Youth or something? Or am I dreaming when I say something like, is that a stretch? I think it's horrible. But you you agree with me that it's horrible noise. I, I wouldn't go out of my way to listen to it. Yeah, it's it's not my cup of tea. I liked when, no. when, when what about Heather, the Heather what was about doing this screaming too. But it was it actually was cool... Because that part was when George left and they were all letting their emotions out and playing this wild music. It was and cathartic it was, for them. It was cool, actually. It was like the three remaining Beatles and Yoko Ono just going nuts for a couple of hours or something. Do you guys ever do that when you were playing with the Dead Milkman? Oh, oh we've, we've, we've played some terrible jammy noise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um but but not like Yoko screaming. Not Yoko screaming. No, but you guys do jam jam around to warm up and stuff. It's more yeah, Rodney'll do some improv. Oh, I love that. We're 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 a pretty terrible jam band as far as jams go, but we'll still do it. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> what about like the Beatles assistant Mal playing the anvil on Maxwell Silver Hammer? That's pretty cool. He, Not he, one of my favorite songs. I liked it when I was a kid, but... But he actually... I Mal did a bunch of little things like that on songs, I believe. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. And he was a bouncer at the Cavern Club. Did you guys, as Dead Milkmen, ever have a guy like Mal that was like your assistant that traveled with you and you'd say, get me a latte? We had assistants at various on various tours. We would call them the roadie. And they would help out or guitar drum keyboard tech oh we had yeah a guy named matt for the the last half of our touring career who was very awesome yeah that's key i'm sure because you have to all the this equipment that you have to maintain we had a, a regular tour manager for most of our uh career who still tour manages for us every now and then mm-hmm 
That's he's cool. since gone on to tour manage for bands like Sonic Youth and the Monkees. Thoughts on Phil Spector's production versus like Let It Be Naked or Glyn John's Let Get Back album mix. I don't know if you heard that. I haven't heard the Glyn John's yet. I n never disliked the Phil Spector, Phil Spector treatment. I never disliked it. I understand uh, Paul didn't like the treatment of The Long and Winding Road. But I do like the Naked album. Yeah. The, the way The Long and Winding Road sounds. I like both versions of All Across the Universe. Yes. The normal, the normal speed one and the slightly slowed down one. I thought that was a kind of a brilliant touch to this to the recording that that Phil Spector did. It made it more ethereal. I didn't I thought maybe, you know, he poured on the strings too much sometimes. Yeah, that was the style, I think, also. Which, But, you know, I don't even mind it. Like, I love that. Maybe I'm just used to that mix. All right, let's talk about the, real quick, the Dead Milkman record, because like you're saying, you get sick of the Beatles after a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you need some new stuff. So what's the Dead Milkman songwriting process like? Do you guys, like, experiment in the studio like the Beatles, or do you just, like, write songs, uh, like, individually, and then you bring them in, and then everybody adds to it or something? We do a lot of individual writing and then people add to it. Um, we It's rare for us to experiment and just write a song in the studio. I think we did that once or twice. What songs were those? Uh, the, the one called Instant Club It, You'll Dance to Anything was one of those. Yeah, I can see that. It sounds like it was an experiment. No offense. In, in our early days, we would write songs because we didn't have uh, four tracks at home or anything, we would actually come together with segments and compose in rehearsal, not in the studio, right. but in rehearsal, in the rehearsal spot. Of and as time went on and multi-tracking became something you can easily have at home, all of us started writing more complete songs and bringing them in that way, but we still could tweak them or we still do the we still do the and to this day do arrangements in rehearsal. In some ways, Joe Jack, uh, you are the Paul McCartney because you're like the sweet emotional voice, and and Rodney is the is the salty, like vo uh, like you know a voice. I love the songs where you guys do that. You go back and forth. Like Moron is one of my favorite songs by you guys. Well, that's that's an actually that's a good example of a very collaborative song because. Rodney wrote the parts that he sings, and I wrote the part that I sing. It's like your day in the life. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. It's a hard day in the life. <laughs> you know? It really is. So with the new record, does that mean you're going to record it at home, or are you, are you recording in the studio? We're recording it in a studio, but a lot of the songs were recorded, demoed at either Rodney's house or Dean's house or my house or Dan's house. Right. Because now it's gotten to a point where you can all have a little studio at your house. Dean set up an experiment. We did one experimental thing. You'll, I won't talk about it anymore, but it's already been recorded. Um, oh, cool. But it was like a premeditated, let's see what happens if we do this. And we did it. Oh, and you, you, you won't tell us what that is yet? Can you, it's a song off the new record? It's a song that has Dean's music that he wrote that... Uh, we all played together. He wrote it all on keyboards, but it became guitar, bass, oh, drums. Cool. And then Dean had an idea to do a spoken bit where we all speak out slightly, yeah, slightly out of sync with each other, like without hearing what was what the other track was in the headphones. Oh and my gosh! Goes, so it comes together in a weird, spooky so thing, and it's a spooky thing. So Dean Clean is like the intellectual one. He's like George Harrison. Right? Probably. Um, it, it, is, was George, George Harrison the intellectual one? Does the album have a name yet? Or do you not name it until it's done? Or that's like, like an announcement. It has a working title. Punk's Not Dead, but Rush Limbaugh is. Oh, yes. You may have heard that on Big Questions. Yeah, it was Rodney saw it spray painted on a piece of wood. In yeah, Florida. he saw it on a graffiti. A graffito. Check out this episode, which is Dad Jokes with Paul's Boutique cover artist, Jeremy Shatton. <laughs>